everybody. Welcome to the Good Evening Kitties podcast, a Tales from the Crip Review. My name is Melissa, your ghostess with the mostest, and today's episode is a special interview with producer and writer for Tales from the Crypt, as well as producing on Demon Knight and Bordello of Blood. Please welcome Mr. Alan Katz. Nice to meet you, Melissa, and thank you for, uh, for having me on your podcast. Real pleasure to be here. Thank you for being here. Uh, I've been doing the podcast for about five years now, and I go through have and you, I review. Yeah. Have you really? I, it, it's funny. I, I I went through a patch of about two decades of a, of a, of a deepening depression and, and a writer's block that I didn't realize that I was in. And I, I kind of I turned my back on all this for some <laughs> reason. It was, it was so per- perverse. It, it's only really rather recently that, that I suddenly embraced my past, as it were. Well, there is a lot of love for Tales from the Crypt, I'll tell you that. A lot of people it's, really are into it. I decided it, about it five so years nice ago. It is so nice to hear. It, it really is. It, 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 we love doing it. So, yeah, like I said, I've been doing this for a while, and what I basically do is I just review all the episodes and the movies, and so far, after five years, I've done all the movies, and I'm in the last season, um, season seven, which is different because it was in London, I thought it'd be fun to have you on here to talk all about how that came about. So we follow each other on Twitter, and I had mentioned something about an episode that I had put out, and you said you had a lot of fun memories about shooting in London, and so I thought I'd have you on. Um, so I have a couple questions here first before we get started on like all the you know all the dirt, all the spilling the tea of uh, what it was like. Uh, so why did season seven move to London in the first place? <laughs> We did not do it for a very good reason at all. Okay. We shot season seven of Tales from the Crypt in London for the exact same reason we shot Bordello of Blood in Vancouver. And we go into a, a great length on, on the, the podcast that I'm just finishing up called The How Not to Make a Movie Podcast, the Making of Bordello of Blood. We talk about why we made Bordello of Blood in Vancouver. And that was to avoid the IA our union that represented most of our crew here in Los Angeles. It was always an up and down battle. And sometimes Joel, who really was running operations for our side, sometimes Joel had the upper hand and sometimes the union had the upper hand. Uh, I forget Lyle's last name, but the, the, the union chief here in LA and, and, and Joel had a really contentious relationship. We, we did a TV movie for Fox about a couple seasons into to doing Crypt called Weird World. And on the third day of production of Weird World, uh, the union struck our set, shut it down. And so Joel had to drive over from from Warner Brothers to the location where we were and have it out with with the union right there and then. And, of course, we caved and and we unionized. And it cost us money that we did not have in that budget. And so Joel was was, was looking for the opportunities, whatever they could, to to deliver one back to, to Lyle. And so when we went to Vancouver to, to make Bordello of Blood, that was really was a screw you to, to the union. Of course, the <laughs> okay. people who really felt it, the people who only really felt it were our crew. Okay, because, you know? yeah, the only thing I've ever seen online that I could find is that they used up as many U.S. United States actors and locations, and they wanted to try something different. That was what I, the no, only thing I've ever no, found. No, okay. no, it was much more cynical. <laughs> It was the worst kind of business decision because it was a cynical business decision. Yeah. And then after we finished Bordello, uh, we went back and, uh, you know, all the reshoots were, you know, nothing, nothing went well in Bordello and everything was poisoned after that. The, the relationship with the union was still terrible. And so rather than shoot the show in Los Angeles, which would have been the easier, frankly, the better thing to do. I would think budget-wise at least. To oh bring boy. everything over there. <laughs> well, you know, we we didn't take a whole lot with us. We took uh, we took some some keys. We took Greg Melton because you know we, our production design was was essential. We took uh, not much else. When did the idea of that change come about? Was it were they in talks of it like during season five, season six, or was it more of a last minute thing? It was last minute. Last minute. By the time we got to season seven, I think we, we, had, we had lost a lot of our vitality, of our creative vitality, shall we say. It, you know, we, we had a certain formula, Kels in the Crypt. And yes. it, there are certain two or three different story types that we, yeah, we did. And, and after you've, you've visited them 80 some odd times, <laughs> you've, you've kind of spent everything that's there. And, and frankly, 
Now, Scott Nimmerfro still had fuel left in the tank. Me, I, I, me, a Maxima Copa, I was, I was on Creative Fumes. I was looking to the show we were all anticipating doing after Tales from the Crypt, the science fiction series that became Perversions of Science, which I got fired off of negotiations before we even started it. As I moved into season seven, I think something in me was, was, was done. Uh, I, I had, you know, I, I had written and or rewritten so many episodes. I, it, it was no longer a creative challenge or, or even interesting. I'm, I'm ashamed to say, and I, I did, I had not found a way to make it interesting, which really would have been my obli- It was my obligation. I just didn't meet it. But well, I mean, it's still a really good run. That's 93 yeah. episodes. You know, it, you know, this is this is just part of the, of the the thematic approach that I that I take in, in the how not to make a movie podcast because I, I really you know part of a lot of what what that. What our podcast is about really is what Bordello was about, but also what what that last season of Crypt was about. No, for my money, I don't think it's a very good season. I think there are two, three episodes that are good. For me, it's a it's a little hit or miss. Like some are really gr- oh, good. Oh, oh, you're being kind to call it. <laughs> you're being it so little... kind. <laughs> I mean, there's still some some bright spots. There's just a lot of I noticed in <laughs> season spot. seven, even that time, the incidental yeah. music in season se- season seven's Uh-oh. a bit all over the place. Oh man! Well, all right. Uh, well, I was gonna say, how uh, long did you ask stay your in ask England? Your question. Yeah, how long did you stay in England for this? Did you have to live out there for a while, or? Oh gosh, yeah. No, we 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 moved our essential operations to to London now. Now you have to understand there the idea when when that was floated as a place to go to do crypt to to screw to say screw you to the union. Well, Gil's wife is English and my wife is English. Okay. So when the idea came up, we kind of glommed onto the hey, it's England, and that then became the band aid for the lack of creative anything. And as we were you know, that that then became the creative juice was that hey, it's England. We we recognize we'd be able to cast some people that we that we would never been we, HBO would never have paid for you know the, the expensive flights to get some of the talent that that we really would would, would have loved to have uh, have had in the earlier season. So you know that was appealing, uh, and the locations was very very appealing. Part of as we as we made the decision to go, and it was very exciting. We had a a model for how we did the show for all the years that Gil and I did the show seasons uh, three, four, five, and six. Uh, you know when we were in, in Los Angeles, and and the formula was in essence three days in and two days out. And being an anthology, there were never any standing sets. But Greg Melton, and again, this is a testament to, to Greg Melton's genius. If Greg Melton can't imagine and then realize the whole world visually, there's nothing that we can do. We're we're completely stuck. And so what Greg was was able to do with no time. And again, this is something that that we picked up on Freddy's because we had all come from from Freddy's and that madness. And that was an insane creative uh, challenge just to create the ideas and and and. And what, what Greg Melton figured out to do when we were doing Freddy's is he would do night crews. And night crews did the construction. <clears throat> so that in essence, we ran as, as a, a 24, virtually a 24-7 operation just to get all the work done. And so a lot of that same thinking, that, that let's call it a, an, an innovation, how to do uh, an anthology series successfully. Because the problem is you are reinventing the wheel every single week. You're, you're, it's all new sets, all new locations, all new everything. All new, new costumes actors, and actors. Everything. Yeah. everything. It's, it is in our podcast, uh, in the How Not to Make a Movie podcast, our, our assistant and, and the co-producer, Ed Tapia, pointed out, because Ed has become a very successful TV producer in his own right, everything that, that, we, that he learned on Tales, that we learned doing Tales from the Crypt, it made doing a regular... TV show, uh, what did he say? It, it made doing a regular TV show easy, and it made doing feature films boring <laughs> because of the of the challenges. So you, you just we learned how to creatively adapt and figure everything out. But mm-hmm. our formula in Los Angeles was, like I said, it was three days in and two days out. When we crossed the pond, <laughs> 
Well, a lot of things, it just never occurred to us to change our formula. We hired a production manager named Malcolm Christopher. And Malcolm was a, a very you know, skilled TV production manager. He'd done a lot of English TV, but he, he'd also done a, a show called Covington Cross, which was kind of a, a hybrid crossover show, uh, an American and English co-production produced in England, uh, English story, but American actors, English actors. And Malcolm had run that rather successfully for a season, and so he seemed a guy who, who knew how to speak our language. Was that more of an anthology show itself, too, no. or was it just... No, no, okay. no, 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 no. And, <laughs> and, you know, if you don't know how to do an anthology, if you don't know how to, if you don't know how to anticipate the problems that are unique to an anthology that you, you will never face doing a, a show like Covington Cross, if you don't know how to anticipate them, you will find yourself well down the road to, to being in the thick of it before you realize that you did this to yourself, mm. simply because you, you didn't plan for it. In TV production in England, and certainly is the way that they do it is very different. Here in America, and back then, and I won't speak for now, but, but back then, lumber was cheap. Here in, in Los Angeles, building sets is, you know, you put up flats. It's real simple, flats, mm -hmm. you know. Four pieces of wood, you know, kind of hammered together with, with, with cross braces and, and bam, 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 bam. You put up two flats together, three flats together. Now you've got you know, the beginnings of, of a set coming together. Boom, 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 boom. When Gil and I, one of the most exciting days of, of TV production, of any production, but, but for us, was on the first day of pre-production when, when the sets began to go up. And as we would move, we did Tales from the Crypt in various different warehouse locations. And... On that first day of formal prep, when production uh, construction began, you'd walk out onto the set, and of course, uh, all of our crew would have driven, you know, from various parts of the valley in their pickup trucks, taking their massive tool sets that we were renting from them out of out of their pickup trucks and set them all up, and and you'd hear the power tools and especially the the nail guns, the bam 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 mm -hmm. flat, bam 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 flat, bam 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 flat. I mean, this was. Man, this is how you knew that a season of TV was about to be upon us. In England, wood is really, really, really expensive, super expensive. So nobody, nobody really, you don't build sets out of wood unless you have more money than, than God. Well, it seemed and, like a uh, lot of it was just like natural mm -hmm. castles and things like that. Well, you, have great, well, you have, you yes. have great locations. And, and when they do build sets, they build them with, with what's called speed rail. It's just metal. And they're, they're simpler sets that simply, it's just a whole different way of thinking and prepping. And so we still found ourselves, as we stepped in, we anticipated building. On the very first day of formal prep, Gil and I walked out onto the set, uh, on, yeah, on, onto our stage at, at, uh, at Ealing Studios. It's silent. <laughs> And Gil finds Malcolm. And he says, "Malcolm, where, where's, where's, what, what's happening?" And all the, all, all of the construction guys are just milling around. And he said, "Well, you know, they, they, they don't have any tools." Gil said, oh, I, I, "Let me, let me." Actually, the story went this way. Uh, Gil approached Malcolm and he said, "Where's the, where are the Makitas? Where are the Makitas?" And, and Malcolm said, "The what? <laughs> the Makitas? You know, the Makita tool set. You know, the, the electric Makita brand drill set." And Gil said, you know, the Makitas, they, 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 they take them out of the set and they go, bam, 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 bam. And there's a flat, bam, 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 flat, bam, bam, bam. And Malcolm looked at him like he had three heads. Now, you got to understand, guys, our construction crew in London, they didn't drive up many pickups. They got off the tube. And then they walked to Ealing Studio and they expected to find tools waiting for them. Well, nobody told us that. <laughs> Malcolm never bothered to tell us that, oh, by the way, you should rent some tools because whereas in America, they show up with the tools that you were renting. Yeah. Here, you got to do that. So so was it like a mad it, dash to try to get... Oh, my gosh. And then we had to go out and get tools. You know, it's funny. A whole other way of thinking about production, a, a very important part of any set here in, in America, certainly in Los Angeles, is the craft services table. <laughs> Oh, yeah, it's right. It's uh, so different over there. It's, yeah. uh, well, you know, here, you know, on, on, on our budget, you know, we had what we thought was a perfectly nice craft services table mm -hmm. on Tales from the Crypt. Uh, I, I remember just after I started working on Tales, I, I had to go to a meeting with Bob Zemeckis on, on his set. Oh, what's the Mer No, what was he did that uh, with Meryl Streep and Cher? Oh, I'm going up on the title. Uh, Death Becomes Her. He was oh, no, that's uh, oh, Goldie oh, Hawn. Death 
Yeah, yeah, and, and, and death becomes her. Yeah, and right. so uh, we had to go to to Bob's set just to you know for for a quick meeting with Bob, and uh, he was uh, God. We, we we had to hang for a bit, and so we went to the craft services table. That was our cater. <laughs> Their craft services table was the, is equal to our cater. I mean, you could get uh, you could feed a family of a, of a hundred on that <laughs> on their table. Uh, Joel Silver used to refer to our table as gum and water. <laughs> By just enough to get by. Okay. All right, so so I'm I'm just giving you all the the different levels of 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 largesse of craft services largesse. All right, so now we're in London. Yes. And the subject and also of, real real quick, sorry. Uh, yeah, I was yeah, also yeah. curious. Did they fly you first class? Yes. They did. Okay, cool. Yeah, I was wondering. Oh, I was God. like, oh. I feel like they were oh. probably. Yeah, a business, a business. business but that was yeah. on Virgin at the time, and that was, yeah, you know, that was it. It was, it was the best. It was, it was yeah. wonderful. And you got to, you got to, to, to wait for the flight in at Heathrow Airport in in the Virgin Atlantic Lounge, which nice. was, oh my God, <laughs> that was lovely. Uh, what was I talking about? Uh, oh, that you you made it to to London and then. Oh yes, yes, yes. So, so, all right, so so uh, so the question of uh, the table. There at, at Ealing Studios that we'll maintain, and, and and the way that Malcolm asked us was this: He said, "Look, all right, when when the lads come in in the morning, you know, we'll we'll uh, we'll provide them with you know coffee or tea." The question is, what to do about the biscuits? Oh, yeah. like, what? What? He said, "Well, if you if you put the, the biscuit tin out, the lads will take more than one." So. <laughs> and, and that was the question. So, should we just hand them a biscuit? Should we should we allow them to take more than one biscuit with their cup of tea? And that was what was anticipated to be the craft services table. Oh wow! And so we said, no, 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 no. We're we're going to do this like an American production company. We're going to have a table. You put put the biscuit tin out, dude. We'll we'll spring yeah. for a few biscuits. Uh, it, it was just a completely different way of doing things. There, there, there are some very funny stories in, in the Bordello, in, in the How Not to Make a Movie podcast mm-hmm. and Making a Bordello of Blood, where Gil talks about uh, something that happened in England where, you know, even the, the, the catering trucks were very, very different from what we, what we were used to. Yeah. And the, the catering, the food was just it was really subpar. There was there was one one day that Gil tells the story of uh, we a, a bunch of the crew suddenly had, had to, to leave and, and Gil you know, was called to, to to location and the problem was he, apparently a bunch of the crew got sick during the the lunch and it, the, the lunch was, was making our our crew sick and apparently uh, we had to bring in another bus because uh, the crew had puked all over our our catering oh, no. bus. Oh, that's terrible. Oh, was it, it just it, because it was different types of food or just something was wrong with the food? Our crew was English. They were eating English food. Okay. It was not an American crew. It, you know, our crew was completely, completely English. So it so was it, just it, the food was bad. Oh, it was just terrible. Oh. D- did John Cassier record his stuff in the United States for that season or did he have to fly yeah. out to London? J- John, John's life never changed. <laughs> John, okay, John did like... what John did. Where John, John never left... He never left Los Angeles. Uh, okay. You know, if, if in the later days he might have recorded some stuff in his home, I don't know. That was after I was gone. But the whole time that I was there, I always went into a studio and I had some of the most enjoyable crypt hours of my uh, while I was doing crypt, working with John in the recording studio. That was awesome. always great, great, great fun. What was up with the last episode of season seven? Like, why was it a cartoon? The partners were in, had in the back of their mind a animated Crypt Keeper series. Oh, okay. So as, it was just as like we were the coming stone, to an end, stone. yeah, yeah, yeah. It was it was a it was a backdoor, backhanded attempt to, which in the end we we did end up doing. We did a mm-hmm. Saturday morning show. Well, I, I didn't, but the Crypt partners did. Kels and the Crypt Keeper. So you know they were they were experimenting with that idea. Okay. And and frankly, the last episode we shot there. Aside from the fact that it it starred, it has a, in a very small part a guy who became a huge actor. It, it is a very very tired tired show. How long did it take from like start to finish of shooting season seven? All right, once we committed to going there, uh, we were there for about six months. Okay. You know, at first uh, we sent Ed Tapia across first, and Ed, um, you know, we set up. Uh, we were able to get 
uh, studio space at Ealing Studios, which was incredibly exciting. As a film buff, you know, they made some amazing comedies uh, at Ealing Studios starring uh, Alec Guinness. I mean, just a, a very historical film studio. And so to be working there, to be to have our offices there, to be based there, was <clears throat> it was incredibly exciting. Uh, we found incredible places to live. Uh, Gil had a great place uh, in, I think, in, in Chelsea. We found an amazing flat in Knightsbridge, uh, three or four blocks from Harrods. And Harrods became, for my wife, that became you know, the, the commissary. <laughs> it was a wonderful place to live for six months. And so the, the time when, when you weren't working was incredible. Oh, God. All of London was, was there in front of you. The, and it was just when the food was beginning to change. In England, it was just beginning to transition from all pub grub all the time and, and, and really nothing much in the way of, of, of great food to suddenly becoming uh, really a, a, great, a great food destination. So it was the perfect time to be there. The locations it afforded us were great. Our problem was that because we, we had the, the formula backwards, we suddenly found ourselves spending more money on an episode than we had ever spent in Los Angeles, and we couldn't figure out why that was happening. In in the meantime, while we were shooting in London, of course, we were still uh, post-producing for Dello of Blood. And so Gil spent long periods of time back in, in Los Angeles uh, working on, on Bordello. So, you know, a lot of the, the day-to-day producing chores for the seventh season fell into my lap. <laughs> Alas, I just finished making a hash of the the uh, bordello of blood, and I was I, I, I was not a strong, confident producer as I would be now. I was not then, mm-hmm. and so I, you know, rather than getting on top of that situation, it it, it got out of control. And after a certain point, we had uh, well, I had to fire Malcolm Christopher, and I hired another production manager, a terrific guy named Dominic Fulford, who who solved our problem. Uh, he was a really matter of fact, and you know, Malcolm, part of Malcolm's problem with us and he was a lovely person he was very english and the english they on a certain level they never want to tell you the truth and and, and embarrass themselves and embarrass you so they'll they'll tell you what they think you want to hear Mm -hmm. you know like everything's okay we'll figure it out uh you know we'll i I don't know why we're spending more money Uh, you know perhaps if if the the, the nature of the location it, it wasn't we had the formula completely wrong uh we were building too much and using too few locations at first and when we finally flipped it, because Dominic Fulford pointed out what our problem was, yeah, we, we began to get a hold of why we were making a hash. On the plus side, we were able to cast some actors that, oh, we would never have been able to, to get if we had shot the last season mm-hmm. in Los Angeles. Uh, Steve, Steve Coogan, for instance, yeah. comes to mind. The main problem was just that it was more sets than using the actual like natural locations like you guys thought you were going to do. It, yeah, and, and it was just you you know we, we were doing it in a different in a different place. In a lumber one. We walked we, you know, we walked it over confident. <laughs> we we thought yeah. hey, we know how to do this. Well, we knew how to do this in Los Angeles. We did not know how to do it in, in London. I, I we we didn't ask Malcolm the right questions. Around what time in the season did Malcolm leave? And then have the other ones halfway, halfway through, oh, halfway, halfway through. Okay. Yeah, and then so I, I fired Malcolm, and then we had to fire the accountant mm. department because because they 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 were so at sea, and it was not their fault. It it's it really sucks having to fire people when really yeah. you are part of the reason that they're getting fired. And she was a lovely woman. I forget her name. And uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I if I knew her name, I'd apologize right now to her. She she worked her ass off to try to figure out where we were. It really was not her fault. Yeah, making those decisions has, has to be tough. Let's get the dirt. Let's hear the memories and the fun, interesting stories of things that maybe you'd want to bring up from your time in London or even just other things that maybe you haven't brought up. We got to work with, with just some, some, some terrific people there. You know, Bob Hoskins. Mm-hmm. You know, when you get to, to go and have, have dinner with Bob Hoskins, it's great fun. So we, what I always enjoyed, meeting Famous people is neither here nor there to me because I'm, 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 not an, I'm not really a star after my nature. Mm-hmm. Getting to work with those people, now that's quite different. But occasionally getting to meet people, even if you don't get to, well, if you get to meet them in a social 
situation where where it's part and you're you know you're sitting across a dinner table from them as opposed to you know you're visiting their set. Uh, well, yeah, and they're, and they're kind of doing uh, a job, and so yeah. There was there was one evening where I passed up an opportunity, and I I, I would have kicked myself. Uh, now Scott Nimrofro was uh, you know he he wrote as many uh, Scott was for I got in the early days he was uh, Donner Productions head of development, and he was also the Donner Productions liaison with Tales from the Crypt. And Scott also was a, a writer, a terrific writer. I mean, Scott, an amazingly good writer. And after Tales from the Crypt, he went on to do Pushing Daisies and, and Hannibal and uh, and, and uh, Outer Limits. I wrote a, a couple of Outer Limits scripts with him. Mm. Uh, and Scott Scott knew how to to work a room. He he knew how to, to, to do the politics. He was very very good at something that I only recently have learned how to do. <laughs> But, you know, so Scott, you know, whenever, whenever Joel came into London to visit, you know, Scott had a great relationship with Joel. And I didn't have much of a relationship. I, I, you know, I could have. And Joel kept trying to have a relationship with me, and I kept not yes-anding. Mm-hmm. Uh, on, I remember one occasion when Joel handed me his personal copy of the Sandman graphic novel. Now, when Joel hands you a piece of material, he's saying to you, Hey, you should read this and get back to me. I never <laughs> did anything with it. Yeah, and I never, I never even cracked it because, because my my feeling was I was Gil Adler was my partner. You, you don't hand it to both of us. I don't understand what you're trying to do. A silly way to think. Two two small terms, you know. So Joel kept doing things, and I kept resisting. So when we were in London, you know, Joel didn't naturally reach out to me when he would come to visit, and Joel was visiting. He, he, he was uh, his friend Michael Kamen, who was a, a terrific composer, did a lot of big, you know, Joel and Dick's big movies, uh, and he did a couple of scores for Tales from the Crypt. And uh, so there was a, a, a little dinner party that was being thrown at Michael Kamen's house that Joel was putting together. And Scott said, "Hey, you know, there's this dinner party that Joel's putting together. You, you want to come?" And I said, "Oh man, no, 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 I really, no, because I just thought, uh, sitting her across the table with Joel, and I said, no." <laughs> There were two other guests that night at dinner, Annie Lennox and oh. Kate Bush. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, I can see, yeah, I can see how you'd be kicking yourself. Did he know that they were going to be there? Or you just, I don't know. Like no, I, I, I don't think that. I think that was a surprise. Yeah. But it's, yep. it's, it's, it's just, you know, you have to have an expansive yes and way of thinking. Mm-hmm. Where when someone says, hey, come to dinner, you, you, you go, okay, you better have a good reason not to say no. Really, in that situation, because... Hey, that was my boss. Mm-hmm. You go to dinner with your boss. You just do it. You put up with this crap. You do it. But I, I was not thinking the right way at the time, and and uh, it was yeah, it was it was part of 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 that my world shrinking and shrinking, and and I, as I was yeah, you know, the after effects of Bordello of Blood were were profound. It really it shut my world down at the end of the day. Yeah, you were just kind of done. Yeah. Well, yeah, like Bordello of Blood. <laughs> Yeah, the story of the making of Bordello is how everything we did that made Tale successful, we did the exact opposite when we did Bordello. I mean, we didn't even make, I mean, none of us wanted to make Bordello. We were supposed to make the whole, you know, after, uh, after Demon Knight, this, you know, the mandate was three different feature films. Mm-hmm. And uh, Demon Knight was the, the monster movie. And so what we were what we were going to do is, as the second was a completely different movie <clears throat> called Dead Easy. It was a psychological thriller uh, in in the vein of Nick Rogue's Don't Look Now about a a guy with a, uh, a discovered memory. He, he's in his thirties, uh, a discovered memory of his father and uh, some 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 abuse, and, and his his father is now in, in the after in, in the in the kind of afterworld with a curse on him, and he's trying to lure his son back to New Orleans so he can if he can take his son's soul, then the father can come back to life in this world. And he's holding his son's the the, the villain. His father is holding his own grandchild, his own grandson as hostage. And so it's a psychological thriller with a phantom as the villain. It was an incredible challenge to to us creatively. We had spent three months, you know, prepping. Uh, in in New Orleans, 
Greg Melton to spend a great deal of time there, you know, finding, looking for the swaps we wanted. And three weeks before the start of formal pre-production in New Orleans, Universal pulled the plug on Get Easy, and they said, you're not going to make that movie. You're going to make this thing called Bordello of Blood instead. So what happened to the script of Dead Easy? They just canned it, the whole thing? Yeah. Yeah, that is a, that's a drag after spending that much time out there trying to, and then literally three weeks before you're like, oh, okay, I guess I'll just go home. Like, <laughs> Well, the, the larger problem was when they said, well, you're not doing this movie in New Orleans. You're going to do this thing called Bordello of Blood. Well, the, the meter hadn't stopped running. Yeah. We were still three weeks away from starting formal prep on a movie. It just wasn't the one we had been prepping for all for all that time. <laughs> we were now prepping a movie, a script that none of us had ever seen before. And it was a student film. It was a, it, it was the first student movie that Bob Zemeckis and Bob Gale had written when they were at USC. And the reason that Universal wanted us to make it was that around about this time, there was a, uh, this is in the 90s, and there was a, a new entity called DreamWorks just starting mm-hmm. up. And one of the principals was Steven Spielberg. And so Steven was ending his contract with Universal. He was, he was an entity unto himself. And they were beginning to make production deals with, with other talent. And the piece of talent, the Universal, Universal was desperately afraid of losing from their stable and going to Bob's, uh, going to Steven Spielberg's was Bob Zemeckis. He was, he was a cash cow, you know, back to the future. And so they said to, to Bob, Bob, you know, what can we do so that you don't leave? And, and, you know, I'm sure whatever others, the deal points were that Bob said, well, this would be helpful. One of the other things that he, he asked for, you know, he was always incredibly loyal in general, but very loyal to his writing partner, Bob Gale. Mm-hmm. And Gale's career was not anything like Bob Z's was. And so he was always trying to, you know, help Gale in any way he could. So he said, hey, if you were to buy the first script that Gale and I ever wrote when you were at USC, you know, or Della with Blood, that would be nice. The point of the exercise was to put money in Bob Gale's pocket. A fantastic mm-hmm. gesture. Yes. The point was never for us to make it as a feature film. That was never in Bob's head. But, okay, so Universal makes the deal, and now they've just cut a check for half a million dollars for a student film. One of the, exec- one of the writers is the executive producer of a movie they're about to make. Hey, we've, been, we've invested half a million bucks in one script, We've invested peanuts, comparatively, in this other script called Dead Easy. Well, screw Dead Easy. We'll eat that. Hmm. We'll bake that into the cost of the feature film. And, hey, we're no longer eating half a million dollars of cost. We're now laying that off on one of our movie projects. A brilliant, hey, from the point of view of Universal, I can't question that. From the point of view of the guys having to go... Well, I was gonna say I, I would have loved to have seen Dead Easy, but I mean, don't don't be mad, but so I do kind of I do like Bordello. Oh, Melissa, so would we. You but know, I do when... also I do also like Bordello. I did like how it came out. Now, Demon Knights, you know, Demon Knights, a better I, movie. I can I, I can never see Bordello as anything other than a bastard child. Well, you had such a hard time on it. That's why for me, I'm just like oh. woo, you know, <laughs> vampires. But um, but Demon Knight is is the better film for that one, but. I did really like Bordello, and not because of Dennis Miller. He kind of, you know, pulled it down for me. But for me, Angie Everhart and the caretaker for the place, and then the one guy that's, like, at the bench going... Aubrey Morris. Yeah, and then the other guy that's at the bar who's like, you guys looking for sex or whatever? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're we're Canadian actors. Yeah, those three people really carried the movie for me, and I, I like the whole vampires and stuff like that. I, I do understand that there was a lot of issues, and I've listened so far to a couple episodes of the How Not to Make a Movie podcast. I really like it so far. It's very informative, deep dive. So yeah, I'm going to put a link to the first episode in Actually, the show notes. The, so the the episode that that you know, it's the first five episodes are the story component, and then there's a tremendous amount of additional material that just so many stories about not just the making of the movie, but about the making of Tales from the Crypt. Uh, you know, when we doing the podcast was was really none of us had talked about about Bordello and really the impact that it had on some of our lives. I mean, a, a bunch of some of us who made it quit the business. I mean, it had to be therapeutic to like get on there and just let it all out. Cathartic. Yeah. And I, I I started down the road doing it for me because I kind of needed it, and I had talked to Gil a couple times over the course of twenty five years. Our relationship, in essence, did not exist. Mm-hmm. And when I approached Gil to tell the story of, of the making of Dordello of Blood, 
Uh, he was really reluctant at first because it was very painful. It was an, a really unpleasant, it, it, as unpleasant as it was for me, it was really unpleasant for him. It was, this is not a movie he wanted to make. Dead Easy was a movie we all had a vision for. No one had time to have a vision for Bordello of Blood, not that one would have had a vision. Three weeks was all the time we had to do anything before we started shooting. It's how not to make a movie. <laughs> I mean, literally. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and then, look, then there's the fact that we went to Vancouver to say screw you to our union. Well, you know, because we were on the same schedule, we didn't, you know, we went to Vancouver just to go to Vancouver. It was July, and we were making a horror movie. <laughs> now, horror movies, you stop, one of your big stocks in trade is night, dark. Yes. And when you go that far north, that at that point in the summer, one of the one of the things you have very very little of is night. <laughs> if you had two, if you had thought as a producer should, the moment Joel said, "Hey, we're going to make our this movie in Vancouver," someone with a brain should have said, "Joel, I get where you're going. I know why you're going there, but think about this, my friend. Horror movie, Vancouver, July, lack of night. Bad mm -hmm. idea." You know, the the, uh, the one saving grace was we had Greg Melton. Greg built great sets, and and yeah. and, and everything worked worked beautifully. Uh, yeah, we, we we took Greg up with us, but you know because you know the problem with casting Dennis Miller, and again we go into this in great length in, in the podcast. I couldn't tell you why. I, I to this day, Gil and I could not tell you why why Dennis Miller. Well, and my, did he have like a talk show or something at the time or something? On sort HBO, of thing? but 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 on yeah. HBO, but, but but his politics are, are very conservative. And Joel's yeah. are, are rather progressive. Well, and he took he took such a big chunk of the budget too, like just to have him on there, and then he didn't even like the reason. But but there was a reason. There was a reason that happened. Dennis did not want to do the movie, uh, and it, and and we didn't say, "Hey, Dennis, do the movie for a million dollars." He said, "Okay, give me a million dollars, and I'll do it." He figured no one in their right mind would go, "Okay." Here's a check. He said a million dollars, not really. That was his guys go away. He was as shocked as anybody that we said yes. And yeah. when, when Joel said yes to the million dollars to Dennis, that blew our, that blew our minds because that wasn't in the budget. We'd half a million dollars for, for, for that character. And we went to the universal. We said, okay, can we have breakage for half a million dollars? They said, no, we don't want Dennis Miller. Dennis Miller, our audience could not care less about Dennis Miller. <laughs> He's nothing to our audience. I, uh, why? And so Universal said no. And so we took it out of our budget. Hey, where was all the money in our budget? Special effects. Yeah. In, in order to pay for Dennis Miller, we took it out of the bread and butter. Well, what kind of what kind of filmmakers do such stupid things? Well, especially in a horror movie, you want to do practical effects. Yeah, and, yeah, 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 yeah. It's utter madness. And then because we had to pay for Dennis. We couldn't afford to bring our special effects crew up with it. We couldn't afford to bring Todd Masters up. We went with a, a young, hey, they were very enthusiastic, but they had no experience. Uh, mm -hmm. A special effects crew, they had done some, some, some nice work for, for the, uh, uh, for, for the X-Files. But the work on the X-Files was nothing like what we were asking for, melting, uh, melting a vampire prostitutes. Yeah, pulling hearts out of people's Oh, my God, you know, and, uh, yeah. you, you, that, 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 that tongue gag, which is good. But, yeah. but we were asking way more than they had. They didn't have the experience. They didn't have, they didn't have anything. They didn't have the means to do it. And so it, it was not a fair ask on our part. I, I, I don't uh, – uh, Chris Nelson, who, who ran the crew, has won a, he won the Academy, an Academy Award for his work a few years ago on the Suicide Squad. He's a really, really talented guy, but hey, he was just starting out at that point. Yeah, you know, it was not a fair ask on our part, but we, but that's what we subjected everybody to. There, we made every possible mistake you could possibly make. In the end, we had to to bring Todd Masters up, and Todd Masters kind of begged us not to shoot that last, you know, the the climax in our last church because, <laughs> well, then we were obligated to duplicate it. And his feeling was we could do it better if we just shoot the whole thing fresh down in Los Angeles. But in uh, in keeping with our the motif of doing everything wrong, we didn't listen. I mean, you still made a movie, so at least you had something. You made that came a out movie. Oh my god! Oh my okay. god! Uh, so in season seven and stuff, were there any other like actors or or anyone that you met or any like? weird stories that happen on the set or or any other memories like that that happened when you guys were out in London? 
we got to work in, on this in some amazing locations. There's mm-hmm. Dorney Court. Uh, Brian Helgeland directed the episode, and, and he had written it. Brian's an interesting character. He's a really talented writer at the time, and I, I, I don't know how he is today. I'm not the person I am then, so I, I, I cannot assume how he is then. But he, he had one or two really odd eccentricities. Now, it's winter. It's November, December, January when, we, when we're shooting it. When I tell you it's cold, <laughs> it's, it's bloody cold. And one of Brian's conceits at the time was that he, he just did not wear long pants. He's he one did of those not, guys he, that can always wear shorts. He, he just, he wore shorts. Yeah. If he went to a restaurant, a jacket with shorts, you know, a jacket Wait, is tie this for, with shorts. Is this for the episode, A Slight Case of Murder? The one that's in like the, the writer in the house? Yeah, 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 okay. yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah, that was a cool house. Uh, oh my God, yes. So uh, Brian just, uh, when he would go on location, look, when we were in the studio in a couple of days, he would walk, walk, walk around in your shorts. But on location, the rest of the crew, his English crew, looked at him like he was insane. <laughs> Because even the English crew is, 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 you know, is wrapped up in, in as warm as they can be because it's, it's just it's gray and miserable, and it just chills you right to your bones. Walking around in shorts, this is a, an unforced error. I guess he just Why works hot. I suppose, but... I mean, I know, I know a guy that who was the same. Like, he worked with my dad, and he, it was always shorts. You never saw him. He just couldn't do it. <laughs> All right, so Dorney Court, a very cool thing about that location. The man at the time that we shot it, I, I, I hope it's still true. The man who owned Dorney Court when we shot that episode there mm-hmm. is directly related to the man who built it back in the 1300s. Wow. That is astounding. Yeah, and, that's still in the family and everything. Oh, my God. I mean, that's, that's for, for Americans, that's, that's a, that's an inconceivable concept for <laughs> most of us because we're, we're all such recent arrivals to these yeah. schools to begin with. It, it was amazing. Now, he, there was a room in the house, and he was great fun to talk to, talk to and he, he had great stories about his family and the house. And there was a room that he said, he said, hey, there's a room I want to show you. I'm just going to show you the room, and, and I'm not going to say another word. <laughs> he leads down a hallway to this room that is completely internal. There are, there are no windows to it. It is completely internal on every single side. And it was a large sitting room. And he opened the door and turned on the lights. He said, good. And I walked in. And the room was a good 10 degrees colder than the room we had just come from. Oh, no. And I looked at him. And he just, he didn't meet my eyes. And he just walked in. And he sat down. And I sat down. <laughs> the room had a feel to it. And he didn't want to say anything. He didn't. Aside from the cold, I'm a born again, I'm a diehard born again atheist. I am I'm <laughs> I, I, I draw from the womb an atheist. I, 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 I am as hardcore an atheist as you could possibly be. There is something weird in that room. Yeah, yeah. I, just I, I do not goosebumps. believe in ghosts. No, 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 no. There is something weird in that room. Uh, yeah, that the things that make you go. Uh, okay, I, yeah. I do not have an explanation for this uh, unless there are there are chilling mechanisms. Uh, just outside the walls, there's, I don't know why this room is so, you could see your breath. Oh, wow. And it's just such I mean, a, the fact that it's such an room. old house, too, and it goes oh, back yeah. so far, it's like, who knows? I, I said, I said, did anything happen in this room? And he said, to be honest with you, I don't know. He's like, this room just freaks me out, so I thought I'd freak you out, too, coming. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, that, that always stuck with me. Uh, God, among the, God, it was great fun to work with, oh, I'm going up in her name, uh, the American actress who lives in England, she is in Ragtime, oh, she's in uh, 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 Downton Abbey, she plays the, the wife in Downton Abbey, and I can't think of her name, oh, Alan. Uh, we got to work with her because she was an American based in London. Oh, Amelda Staunton, no, she's British, never mind. No, uh, it was great fun to work with her, too, yeah, uh, God, I'm just going up in her name. Elizabeth McGovern. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay. Elizabeth <laughs> McGovern. Oh, my God, my God, my God. Uh, it's funny. Yeah, among the, the people that we got to work with, it was so cool. Elizabeth, Elizabeth McGovern was one of those people who it was just fun because she was in Ragtime. And the Ragtime is not a great movie. Ragtime was one of those movies when I was young. A lot of us, the casting of that movie was, was, was one of the, the great games we all played. How would you cast Ragtime? Elizabeth McGovern uh, is, is terrific in, in the movie. She's wonderful. So and that was one of the people who, for whatever reason, oh, she's great in, in uh, uh, the one where, um, 
uh, with Mary Tyler Moore that Robert Redford directed and Donald Sutherland, uh, 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 Ordinary People. Oh, yeah. Uh, she's wonderful in Ordinary People. So, you know, she was just one of those those, those actors who, if she'd been in, in, in Los Angeles, we probably would have hired her earlier. But because she was in, in London, we, we couldn't get her. Yeah. And so we were really, it was great to, to work with her. Uh, that was, was great fun. Uh, like I said, Steve Coogan uh, was great fun to work with. Uh, Ewan, Ewan McGregor, we would yeah. never been able to get a hold of. And, oh, that was so much fun. Uh, Ewan now McGregor. He's Scottish, though, right? He is, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and uh, Jane Horrocks was also in that yeah. episode. I recently watched that episode because I'm going to review it soon. And I really liked their chemistry together. Oh, they're they great, great, great. great. Really well. it's, 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 it's one of the few really good episodes. Oh, Scott, all of Scott's episodes that season are, are good. Mm. Uh, because Scott still had, had, had the juice. They were they were great fun to work with. Steve Coogan was at that point no one in America knew who Steve Coogan was when we hired Steve Coogan to, to do uh, our episode. But because we were flying backwards and forwards on Virgin Atlantic a lot, the their entertainment system, you know, we, we kind of became we just knew it backwards and forwards because we spent so many hours in flight on Virgin Atlantic, and they had uh, a radio show that Steve Coogan had done called uh, the Alan the Alan Partridge Show, and that killed us. We loved that character so much <laughs> that we were quoting him. I mean, we that that became our Monty Python uh, between Scott and, and I and and, and Tapio. I mean, we all just we adored every last bit of that. And so when the when we could hire Steve Coogan, oh, we had to have him. And you know, in that episode, there's also uh, Julia Sawala plays plays with him as well. So mm-hmm. we got as, as much of the Ab Fab cast as we could. We. We, we we wanted all of them, but you, you know, some yeah, people, between her and not. Jane Horrocks, yeah. So you know, we we got some, we couldn't get all. The there are two people who we tried to get, we came kind of close to getting, and we didn't get, and it breaks my heart to this day. Uh, one was an actor, uh, Alec Guinness, Sir Alec. We we were in discussions with him. We we had his personal phone number. Gil spoke with him directly. We were so close to getting him, and then I guess uh, Sir Alec's son took ill. And uh, Sir Alex suddenly became unavailable. And that broke our, our hearts. It broke my heart because he is one of my favorite actors. Oh, my God, to have worked with him would have been... Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, the other was a composer that we just couldn't we couldn't get. And that was... Uh, oh, well, and, and, and that was... Uh, oh, Alan. Um, Brothers in Arms. Um, God, great guitarist. Oh, my God, I'm, 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 I'm having a senior moment here. This is horrible. Dire Straits, yeah. It'll, 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 Is it you're, Mark, you're, Mark Knopfler? Mark Knopfler, thank you. God, God, God. Uh, there's so many stuff in my head. Right? Yeah, my, we, we tried so hard to get Mark Knopfler. God, I love Mark Knopfler. Wanted Mark Knopfler desperately. We just couldn't get Mark Knopfler. To do music or to be in it? To, to be in, music. To, to do music, music, to do it for us. And we, we tried very hard. Uh, uh, no, man, I'm going to about to go up in another name. The, the, the director of... Uh, Train spotting is director. Uh, let's see. Uh, is it Danny Boyle. Danny Boyle, thank you. Oh, yeah. boy, this is I, I mean, I got Google, so that's why. Uh, so yeah, so uh, we, we we had Danny Boyle in. He had a conversation with us, but he was working on something else, and so we couldn't we couldn't get him. We couldn't make the scheduling work, but we tried really really hard to get Danny Boyle. So you know, there were a lot of people who were available to us that would never have been available to us in the past. Oh, and God, uh, the, one of our first directors was Freddie Francis, who directed the feature, Tales from yeah. the Crib. Yeah. For last respects, I don't think the transfer was as good as it was in the no. 72 movie. No, no, but, no, no, no. no. It, it was, it, it, it's very tired, but yeah, yeah you, you're, we're, we're doing it because we could. Mm-hmm. And so, because it's the seventh season, you know, there's a lot of mediocre stuff that, that we, frankly, just got away with. That's still cool, though, to have the, the director of... Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'd be like, you okay, know, sure, whatever you want to do. Uh, unfortunately, we, we were a little out of gas, so we, 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 we couldn't fire on all cylinders, but... Uh, eh. <laughs> All right. Well, tell me uh, just a little bit more about, uh, like, give me a small, we're going to be wrapping up here. Give me a small plug about how not to make a movie or anything else that you got going on that you want to promote. Well, it's funny. The, in doing the podcast, it, it, uh, suddenly Gil and, Gil and Andrew and I have a relationship again. We're, we're friends again. Well, that's good. Uh, and uh, we're, we're working, well, first of all, 
I'm about to do the final episode of the How Not to Make a Movie podcast, The Making of Bordello of Blood. That will be the end of season one. But we're going to do a season two, which will start probably late August, which is going to be called How Not to Make a Movie Horror Stories from the Filmmaking Trenches. And Gil and I will host it together. And in the way that we, that Bordello of Blood is, 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 is really, it's a whole saga of, of filmmaking horror stories, of what goes, of what can happen when filmmaking goes off the rails. And so we're going to tell all those kinds of stories. We, we know an awful lot of people between us, Gil and I, and, and a lot of those people have already agreed to, to come on and, and be our guests and, and tell us their horror stories and see if they can go toe-to-toe with Bordello of Blood. As well, that's the awesome. Mother of all horror stories. And see, like, who who could outdo it and be like, oh, well, that's even worse. Like, yeah, hey, you, you, you think bad crap happened on your set? Look what happened on our set. You know, <laughs> and, cool. and everyone's got, we've all got filmmaking horror stories where, where yeah, things yeah. went, and stories about executives. There are stories that Gil and I haven't even touched on yet that from our, our independent filmmaking history, our, our, our filmmaking history together. And in addition, so we're going to, so there's the second season of How Not to Make a Movie podcast, which will be starting up shortly in addition to the first season, but uh, Gil and I are working on a horror project together, a series. Nice. What's that about? Uh, did you say? Well, I, I, I don't want to give away too much, but mm. I think what we have in our mind would be that, hey, nothing has stepped in to replace The Walking Dead. This would replace The Walking Dead. Hey, it's, it's The Walking Dead. It would be from the zombies point of view if it was about zombies. Okay. But we're not doing it about zombies. Yeah, the, the monsters that we have in mind, it will be from the monster's point of view. Okay, cool. And so that's what we're working on. The next season of How Not to Make a Movie podcast, is that still going to be running through uh, Dads from the Crypt? They will be our partners in crime on that because, okay. uh, you know, they, hey, they were there at the beginning. You, 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 you get to go along for the whole ride. <laughs> and, and they're lovely guys. They're, they're, yeah. they're in, you know, hey, if, if, if we could find a thing to do with, with you. I would because you know we're it's a very symbiotic thing. Yeah, I mean maybe down the road. Yeah, but this I mean this yeah. interview is great. I don't normally have a whole lot of people. It's usually like my friends I have on here for the most yeah, part. Yeah, I'm yeah, pretty but, shy, but, so. But but that's up until today. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and uh, you're you're doing a wonderful job, and and you know we we all have the most remarkable stories to tell. My attitude it all goes back to to New Orleans, laissez rouler les bon temps, which means let the good times roll. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much for being on here today and talking with me. And yeah, it's just, it's been lovely. 